Thanks for watching a message today. My name is Caleb Combs. I'm the gathering pastor here at the river, and we would love to connect with you. An easy way to do that is text River Connect, no space, to 97000. Or you can visit our website for more information. If you'd like to support the River Church financially, you can text an amount to 84321 or again visit our website, theriverchurch.cc, and click the giving tab. We hope you enjoy and are challenged by the message today. Good morning. Come on, this is so cool to be back. I was just here about three weeks ago for Beauty for Ashes on the stage. Was anybody here for that event? Beauty for Ashes? It was awesome. This place was packed. People looking to do their part to fight human trafficking and give support to people. And now we're back today to talk about family, a great, great topic. You're going to want to get notes. You're going to want to get your iPads, your iPhones out. We're going to cover a ton of history, some great points. You're going to leave here fulfilled, I promise you. Because family is a big deal. It's a big deal at this church. It's a big deal in the Word. And it's going to be a big deal for the future. And we get to study it today. Now, there's some things that I'm going to talk about that you may already be doing, which is great. We call that validation. But there's some other things that you could be doing that we call a challenge that you need to put into action. So one way or another, you're going to be impacted. And before I begin, I always like to talk about the authority of the Word of God. And it's fascinating when you think about how the Bible has sustained all these years. And then when you realize what chapter we're going to go talk about, realize when that was written, how it applies today, it is even more miraculous. So just to set the tone, the Word of God, the one you have, you got a Bible, hold your Bible up. You got a hand Bible, a digital Bible, it doesn't matter. Hold it up. Okay, check this out. That book right there was written over a 1,600-year period. 1,600 years from Genesis to Revelation. That book that you just held up, that app on your phone, ready for this? 40 different authors. 40. 13 countries. That means these authors were spread over 13 countries. Over three continents. And it's written in three different languages. Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew. And then it was all put together... And you can buy it today at Walmart. You can download it on your app store. When you look at anything ever created and people that try to destroy the word of God, they're gone, the word's here. So that's the authority that we're going to talk about today. And then when we read our scripture in just a second, you're going to see that it's coming out of the second book of Kings, which is the Old Testament. Now, for those that are just getting into the word, maybe those watching, the Bible split in two. The Old Testament and then the New Testament. The Old Testament was the law. The New Testament is grace. So we're going to be in the Old Testament in the book of Kings. Now there's two books. First Kings, Second Kings. And if you look at different books, uh, for instance, the, the Jewish faith, they, they make them one book. But in the Bible you have, we have two chapters, First and Second Kings. And for the sake of knowledge and background, I think it's important to know that, that during that time period of the Old Testament... This world that we live in now didn't operate the same way. In fact, the Lord had a, a, a set way of dealing with things and talking and communicating. And the Lord used judges, kings, and prophets. Now, it's important to know all that because what we're going to talk about in 2 Kings, it was actually written by a prophet. Some say it's Jeremiah. Maybe. I don't know. I wasn't there. But I do know this. The book of Kings was there to chronicle historic movements that happened during that time, about 580 B.C., 580 years before Christ. So when you look at the actual word that we're going to read here in just a second, I want you to, for the historic background, know that all it is is to chronicle historic events. But the power of the Bible is to take those events, see how they're written, and apply them to today. Like, how can you take something that's written 2,600 years ago for historic purposes and pull out lessons? And by the time I'm done speaking, I can promise you this. You're going to love the life lessons that that story that we're about to read in 2 Kings 6 is going to apply to you today. You're going to be encouraged. You're going to be challenged. And you're going to be, you're going to be moved because that's the power of the word of God written over all those years by all those authors 
and all those languages. So if you would turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 to 23. I'm just going to read them. And then we're going to talk and I'm going to come back. So it's 2 Kings chapter 6. We're going to go right into verse 8, into chapter 8 or 6, all the way to 23. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. Verse 9, the man of God sent word to the king of Israel. Beware of passing that place because the Aramarians are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place that was indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was always on his guard in such places. Verse 11, this is strange king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, tell me which one of us is on the side of the king of Israel. They were fighting, the Arameans and the Israelites. This enraged the king. Verse 12, none of us, the Lord, none of us, none of us are doing this, they said, one officer after another. But Elisha, the prophet, who was in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the very words that you speak in your own bedroom. King says, go find out where he is so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He's in Dothan. Then he sent his horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and they surrounded the city. Verse 15. When the servant of man, the servant of man to the man of God, got up in the morning and went out, he looked up and saw the horses and chariots surrounding the city. Oh no, my Lord, he said. What are we going to do? The servant asked, more like screamed. Verse 16. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open the eyes, Lord, that they may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck him with blindness as Elisha asked. Elisha told him, Verse 19, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you're looking for. And he led them to Samaria. Verse 20, after they entered the city of Elisha, the Lord opened the eyes of these men so they could see. Then the Lord opened the eyes and they looked and they were in Samaria. Verse 21, when the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, referring to the enemies, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? Verse 22, don't kill them, he answered. Would you kill those who have captured by your own sword and your own boat? Give them food and water. Let them go. Let them eat and drink. Go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. The king of Israel prepared this great feast. And they all had finished eating and drinking. He sent them on their way and they returned to their master. Most important line of this entire recount. So the bands of the Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. The only other word I would add is the word forever. So let me introduce you to my family. So this is my family. My wife, Jamie, and I are going to be married uh, for 28 years this July 23rd. Family. Family. Family pick. Family pick. There we go. <laughs> so that's me and my wife, Jamie. We're at a, uh, a wedding this summer just uh, outside of Gladwin. To Jamie's right, in the middle, is my son Riley. Riley was our firstborn. He's 23. Riley is a, a master's student at U of M in Flint, and uh, he's studying biology. He's uh, applied to a number of dental schools. Next to him is his girlfriend. They're in a great relationship. Her name is Taylor, Taylor Farrell. Next to Taylor is Emma, and Emma's with my son, my youngest, Jordan, and they're in a relationship, and... Uh, Jordan is going to be 21 this May. He's a junior in college. Both of them own their own businesses. Both of them are dynamic. Both of them are great kids. My wife, Jamie, and I um, only had two boys. We really don't know what it would be like to raise a girl. So we're so thankful we don't have one. No offense. But uh, we have two great girls that are in our family right now. Now that right there literally was taken in 2021. I could go on and on about the things that... that have gone on our whole life, but I want to show you another picture. Because to get to that picture, 
you, you've got to go through a process. So let's put up the younger picture. That was taken 2006. To get to that picture, to the picture I just showed you, there's a process, there's time. Riley and Jordan are, are, are young boys. There's no other people in our family. My, my career is not even close to where it is now. We've got a whole different style, a whole different way of living. We weren't even living in the same house that we're living in. So many things have changed. So to go from young Swanson family to current Swanson family, this whole process, all this time, I couldn't speed it up and I couldn't slow it down. The family that God gave me, the wife that he gave me, the boys that he gave me, that family right there, there are things that are going to happen that we all have to agree on when it comes to family. Number one, there are highs and lows. There are storms and sunshine. There are seasons of trial and seasons of celebration. There are decisions that young people and parents are going to make that you can't even, you can't even, and I can't even explain how they do this. Like, why would you do this? Some decisions, they work out. Some decisions are destructive. I do know this. From the young Swanson family to the now Swanson family, there were some significant ups and downs. But on a picture, only I know. The second thing is, that picture of young Swanson to current Swanson, it's hard to raise a family. Not only are there ups and downs, it is difficult. It is difficult because the world's going to throw things at you. In that picture, we have significant medical issues. My son broke his femur when he was 10. We have obviously times where my family's been sick. We've had death. We, we've had ups and downs in business. We've lost things. We've had issues just like you. We, we are, nobody in this room, nobody watching is immune to the ups and the downs and the difficulty of life. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. You may be in that right now. You may be thinking, listen, I, I'm running high. Everything is great. We're on an up. Because we just came from a low part. We just came from something and we're going to enjoy the moment. Well, that's, that's great. I don't know when that's going to change, but it's going to change just like when you're down. You're thinking, I don't know if we're ever going to get out of here. I do this, I do this, I do this. I hope, I pray, I do this. Well, let me just say, there's, there's, there's always sunshine above the clouds. But we can agree that no matter where your family is, not only their ups and downs is difficult, there's one thing that remains. You need that family. We are not designed to be alone. And family doesn't necessarily need to have your DNA. There are some people in this room that are closer to people not related to them than people they are. There are people that you work with that have been through so much with you. Let me just tell you, family are the ones that regardless of the up or the down or the work put in or the work needed, they're right there with you. And they've been there with you. And they're going to be there with you. They're the ones that when something happens, they're the first ones you want to tell. When there's a challenge, they're the first ones you want to call. I know this. In my professional life, I have and will continue to see a lot of tragedy. I have and I will continue to see a lot of death. A lot of broken families, families whose loved ones have been sentenced, families whose loved ones have been killed, who've been assaulted, families of loved ones where they need some type of intervention because they have nowhere to go. 
I've seen families that have addicts that they have been fighting for years to get clean. And one thing is for sure, and the one thing I always ask, I say, who's the closest to you right now that you can call upon to walk this walk with you? I've never done a death notification and left somebody alone. When a loved one or somebody's ripped away, I, I know that moment you need somebody to pick them up. You need a strong, loving family member. And that's why family is so important. So today, for whatever reason, what brought you here, why you're watching, I really, really need us, myself included, to focus on what the second book in the Old Testament called Kings says about family. And if you think, Chris, how in the world does a battle between the Arameans and the Israelites apply to me today? Well, let me show you the supernatural, unconditional love of your Savior who wrote a book for us to help you understand. So let's break this down. Second Kings, chapter 6. Who is Elisha? S-H-A. Elisha was the student, was the protege, was the second in command to Elijah with a J. Elijah was tutoring Elisha. It's important you know this. Because when Elisha was a prophet, he was one that the Lord took up to heaven without dying. Elisha would walk and he would be a commentator for the, the Lord. He would tell people. He would share. He was a prophet. Elisha loved him. Elisha said to Elisha, when you go, I would love to take your spot. Elisha said, well, you follow me and wherever I go, whenever I'm taking up, if you're there, you will get what you ask for. What is it you want? Elisha has seen the work that Elijah has done and said, I want a double portion of what you've had. And he said, if you witness that transformation and take my cloak, you will get it. Elisha didn't want more money. He didn't want more status. He wanted more ability to touch lives. Elisha wanted more ability to impact, in fact, twice as much as his mentor had. Sure enough, you can go back in the second chapter, you'll see Elijah's taken up, he drops the cloak, Elisha's there to pick it up, he's got a double portion. That's the Elisha we're talking about. Everybody's been wanting to take out the Israelites. You can go back in the Word, you can just see it, like they're, they're, they're an enemy of the world, they're the people. The Lord set them apart. And so they have a lot of enemies, just like you. When, when you are part of the family of God, there will be attacks. People think that when you're saved and things happen, sometimes you wonder, in the midst of a storm, I get saved, and then the storm still rages and sometimes picks up. Just look in history. History is a great lesson to predict the future. So know that it's just not you. And we're engaged in this battle the king of Aram is attacking the Israelites. But he says in the first part of the chapter, he gets his crew around. He says, hey, we're going to go to this place. And the Bible says such and such. And we're going to surround uh, the, the, the Israelites. We're going to crush them. Elisha is a prophet. He goes to his king, the Israelite king, and said, hey, just want to let you know, 200 yards to the left, take a right, and you're going to see they're going to attack you right there. I'd say stay clear. The king of Israel is smart enough to know that Elisha knows what he's talking about. What does he say? All right, we're not going to go there. The king who's doing the attack goes there, boom. They get checkmated. They get counterpunched. This happens over and over. The king of Aram says, guys, seriously, what's going on here? Who's the snitch? Who's the snitch? Who's the mole? Every time I do something, I plan this is what happens. You tell me, is it you? He goes to his generals, is it you? And his general's like, it ain't us. Because they know if they did that, they'd all be dead, including their families and every livestock. He goes, is it you guys? 
You tell me, who is it? Well, these guys aren't dumb. I'm going to tell you this. The people closest to any problem have the solution. Remember that. When you and I are scrambling or running around trying to figure something out, go right to the people that are closest to the problem. They have the solution. They said, King, I'm going to tell you right now. We know where, where the leak is. And his name is Elisha. And the king says, you go find that guy. You tell me where he is, and we're going to go slaughter him. You tell me where he is. And sure enough, they tell him where he is. And they surround him. First lesson in family, and there are five, and then we'll be done. The Bible records in that same chapter, verse 9, highlight or underline in your Bible that the one that he is trying to take out, the one that has the ability, the double portion, they don't even name him by name. You know what the Bible says in the start of verse 9? The man of God. The man of God. You want a strong family? Be a family of God. Not just a wife. Not just a husband. Not just, hey, my wife takes care of all the kids. She takes them to, she takes them to Sunday school. She does all that stuff. Man, I'm out there grinding. I'm out there grinding, man. I got to make it for the family. Oh, Jim will take care of the boys. Jim will take care of it. He does all that stuff. I, I do all this stuff. Oh, my grandparents, they, they just love it. We go here, we do this. They, they grew up in the church. They're going to take care of our family. Too much is given, much is required. And there's no age limit. It's cute to take your kids to church during the Christmas shows when they were little. But what happens when they're teens and young 20s? A family of God means everybody. A man of God is one that's set apart. And you just don't become a man or a woman of God one day, just like you can't become a family of God in one day. It's a process. And when you commit to be a family of God, even if yesterday you weren't a family of God, the Bible says die to self daily, today is a new day, you can make that commitment today. There are people that are saved that are not a family of God like they should be. You may be one of those seasons where you have been distant. And of course, Satan's telling the lies and, and he's telling you all these things to keep you out of this and, and you don't want this and, and, and church is this and they some of that let me down here and they're blowing money here. And they, listen, if whatever you're doing is destroying the family, then counterpunch with something that's going to construct the family. You can't coexist light and darkness. You've got to build the family unit to become a family of God. What does that mean? That's why we're doing this series. There's not one right answer. There's not one thing. But I do know there is one place. And that is under the umbrella of biblical foundations. I don't know how the answer... I mean, I know how to make a baby. I don't know how to raise one. <laughs> I didn't know every step. I mean, I, I don't know, like, what happens when they're 10. I've never had a boy who's going to be 24 years old. I've never had any of them. I don't know that, but I do know this. I'm going to be a man of God, and he's going to walk with me. Be a family of God. Commit to it. And it's got to be everybody. Grandparents, if you're raising kids, grandkids, if for some reason you've been torn apart, you're the one that needs to take the first step and say, that's it, time out. We're becoming a family of God. Lesson number two. Skip down to verse 16. When Elisha is resting in the camp, his servant goes out to grab a cup of coffee. As he comes out of the tent, he looks, and they're surrounded. They got chariots, they got horses, man. They are surrounded. This servant of God to Elisha, he freaks out. He panics. He panics. He runs back into the tent. He's like, hey, hey, boss, you won't believe this. And you know what happens when you ever get woke up early? You know, you're kind of out of it, dazed, and you smell bad. Your hair's everywhere, and you're scratching in places because you've been all just, yeah, he's just like, ah, yeah. And he's like, man, you got to come out here, man. We are surrounded. And Elisha walks out. He looks. 
just like a boss, he goes, yeah, there's more of us than them. I got to believe his servant was literally tripping out. Like, what do you mean there's more of us than them? Can you see them? And here's what Elisha says to his subordinate, to the one he's taking care of, to his little boys. He said, don't be afraid. You know, I, I got a call yesterday from a, a person. You don't know who this person is, but they're in the ministry. And they called with a concern, a very, very big concern. And they pastor a huge church. And again, you would not know who this person is, so don't try to be a fortune teller, all right? And he's a, he's a veteran pastor. And as I was talking to him, he asked a question. Hey, man, just tell me, is this going to bang, bang, bang? I said, Pastor, you ain't got nothing to worry about. Don't worry about it. It's just some, some things we got to take care of. I want to put you in the right path. It'll be fine. You know, sometimes people to store, uh, to store treasures, to, to restore, to build, they just need to be told some simple words. Hey, it's going to be all right. You know, those are very calming words in a storm. It's going to be okay. As a medic, I, I, I actually became a paramedic when I was 20. I became a police officer when I was 21. I'm still a licensed paramedic. I love working on patients, whether it's a medical or traumatic emergency. And at 20 years old, all right, imagine young 20-year-old, I'm in the back of a rig, and you're circling the drain, all right? I got stuff I'm doing. I'm putting needles in and drugs. I'm drawing things up. And it, it, it happened all the time. People would look to me. Because, of course, you got people that are older than 20 years old. And they would say, are you even old enough to do this? And I'd say, ma'am, sir, you ain't got nothing to worry about. The only time you need to worry is if I look worried. And if I look worried, you're probably going to die. <laughs> people are looking at caregivers and they're asking, am I going to be okay? They didn't ask, okay, hey, what did you get on that cardiovascular final? How'd you do in pharmacology? When you were studying acid-based balance, how, they didn't know and care about that at all. You know what they want to know? Are they going to be okay? You got people that are, that are your, the Elijah's, the, the servants. You have people that are around you right now. Sometimes people just need to be assured. Don't be afraid. And let's go to some place that can give you comfort. And this morning... It has to be called the River Church. And when there's other events like date nights, it happens to be called the date night. And when there's other events like jamming Christian music in your car, a Phil Wickham concert, a Christian environment where Christian friends are hanging out, not talking about the Bible, just hanging out. When you're with a place and in a place where it gives you comfort, there's no need to be afraid. And when you put yourself in those positions as a family of God, you ain't got to worry about nothing. The Bible says in Philippians 4, you, you, you have nothing to worry about. You, you have nothing that, that he will direct your steps. Fear not. You, you, not, you haven't been created in the spirit of fear, but yet victory. I mean, speak these words into existence. And they're not easy, trust me. Nothing what I'm saying is easy. I'm following the same playbook. I'm in it with you. But I want people in my head, my life, I want Jamie to tell me when I'm going sideways, hey, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I remember in 2011, we had some things, you know, some, we didn't, we, yeah, it was just terrible. I remember I got, uh, I got a phone call from my accountant. I'm, I'm, I'm really going to shed some personal things here. But uh, we had a business and we had some, it was just crazy. We sold it and things moved. It was just a busy year, right? My accountant called me and I'm on my way to Grand Rapids. I was driving by myself and he said, hey, he said, uh, where are you right now? I said, I'm, I'm driving. He goes, well, listen, uh, can you pull over? I'm like, dude, <laughs> what is about to go down? And this is 2011, so I got some time. I've been a guy, I got over this. But he says, hey, man, he says, uh, you owe the IRS $58,000. I'm 
I needed somebody to tell me, don't be afraid. All right? You're not going to win that fight. In 2004, when I, when I realized, August 30th, 2004, that's why it's seared in my head, that I was $480,000 in debt. Like, that's a moment I needed somebody to say, it's going to be okay. You may have those moments in your life, and, and you know what? All these years later, guess what? It is okay. I got through it because I had family around me. I had family around me. The second lesson after be a family of God is don't be afraid. Skip down to verse 17 because the third principle of a solid family is, and Elisha what? Prayed. See, the Bible is God's way to communicate to us. Prayer is our way to communicate to God. Now, I gotta, I gotta be up front. I have never, maybe somebody has, I can't say it doesn't happen. I have never, Chris Swanson has never heard the audible voice of God. I have never heard that. I've read about it. Some people have said that. I have not, all right? But I do know this. When I pray, he hears. How do I know that? because I have faith. Just like when I pick up my phone, I got to believe that when I hit some buttons, I'm talking to the human on the other side. I don't need to know how it works. I can't even figure out how it works. I have no idea. But I do know this. Faith, as an example right there, I believe that he hears my words. And the Bible says to pray and pray continuously. That means that you don't always have to have a dinner mark to remind yourself to pray. That means that you don't always have to have a moment of tragedy. You don't need to be punched in the face to realize, hey, you know what? I should pray. I tell you, there's a lot of people that are really open to prayer when tragedy strikes, when someone's in the ER. You get these emergency, and I, and I hope that we continue to do them, these emergency prayer chains. When people's lives are spiraling out of control. What about when they weren't spiraling out of control? Why can't we do a prayer chain of just all blessing? Hey, emergency, emergency, everything's going great. I need prayer to keep it going. Guilty is charged. So what I do is I make sure that I pray continuously. I, I mark my mornings. Jamie and I just talked about this. We did a, a couple's uh, date night with The Rock, and uh, we talked about how we pray. And one of the things I do, we, we it just... Part of my thing, and I did it this morning, is before my feet hit the ground and my alarm goes off and I know what I'm doing, Father, thank you for getting me up today. Thank you for safety. I just pray that I have the wisdom and discernment of Solomon. Let doors open, close doors that need to be closed. Just bring me into people's lives today. Lord, use the words that you've given me to speak to the River Church. Let it pierce hearts. Like right out of the gate, I'm praying before anything gets distracted. Lord, be with Riley. Pray that he gets into dental school. Pray that he does this thing. Be with Taylor. Be with Emma. Lord, let them be, let them be you know, two couples that honor you and all they think, say, and do. When they're with me, when they're not with me. Lord, allow me to be used in my professional position to touch lives, to impact people. Lord, thank you for my wife. Thank you for safety. I, I flew in yesterday night. I had a quick turnaround trip. It was just a terrible blizzard. You know, I don't want to just be the guy who prays when the plane goes up and when it lands, I forget. Lord, thank you for safe travel. Thank you for the things that happened. Thank you for the influence. Blah, 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 blah. Thank, 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 thank. Don't always ask, ask, ask. Imagine somebody in your own family that every time you saw them, their name pop up, they wanted something. You'd be like, ah! Don't be that person. Pray continuously. That picture that I have up there I hope the future works out the way I, I hope it does. But I will tell you this. If you're not praying for your kids and grandkids as spouses right now, then you're missing out. Since they were babies, Lord, I pray for their spouses. I pray whoever they are, wherever they are, that they are just built every day to be godly women. That they are built every day to honor you. That they stay pure. That they stay the people that they are. So we can, I pray for them as babies, like 15, 16, 17 years ago. I've told both Taylor and Emma, we've been praying by name for our boys to find people. And I don't say that because we're any, I, I, I take this serious and you may be doing that now. If you're not praying for people in your family before it happens, then you're missing out on the foundation of family. You see what happened here, Elisha, 
this, this guy's a prophet. Like he's got a direct connect to God. And what does he do? He prays. He could easily say, oh man, I got this. You know, you know who I am? Be a family of God. Don't be afraid. Pray continuously. Number four, skip all the way down to verse 21. After they've captured everybody, when the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elijah, shall I kill him, my father? You want me to kill him? Vengeance. Revenge. Get back. That's tough. Verse 22, he says, don't kill him. Give him food. I'm going to tell you this. There's people in your life that are your family. And they've done you wrong. I, I know it. I know it. I, I know that there's people that, have, that are very close to me that have said some horrible things. They've lied and they've done some things. You've probably got people thinking about right now in your head. You're like, yeah, I can see your face. <laughs> you want to have a godly family? Example of the same thing that's been given to you. Grace and mercy. And that's tough. That is tough. There are people that I've let down that have given me grace and mercy. I remember one particular guy, I, uh, I entered in a, uh, a, a lease agreement and I leased a 55,000 square foot warehouse. And, um, and I, I wrote this lease up and within a few months, the whole idea that I had <laughs> collapsed. I lost a hundred grand just like that. All my savings, everything Jamie and I had lost it. And I still had nine months of a lease and the lease was 5,500 a month. There's no way I could have done it. But I hope you're watching right now. The Piper family, they let me out of that lease. They understood what happened and they're like, hey, no, cool, no, we're fine. And, and every time I see him, I'm like, don't forget, you got the keys to Swanson's kingdom. Whatever you need, it's a yes. Because I never forget people who showed me grace and mercy. I know there's things that I've done, young kid, as an adult, I've disrespected people, my parents, and, and I know that there's things that I could come up with of all the reasons why they've disappointed, but every time I think about it, I know that I've done the same thing. Let me just tell you, you want to be a godly family, practice grace and mercy with others. It, it, it is, and that, that part is forgiveness, people did you wrong. I'm not saying excuse what they did, and this is more about you than what they do. You could go but to somebody, if you have a beef with somebody right now, and every time you hear their name, you think about them like you're doing right now, every time you go by a particular place and you sear in anger and you start to, to, to taste your own vomit, and you think about them at night and it keeps you up at 3.22 a.m., and okay, that ain't peace. Forgiveness is just saying, that's it, Lord. You take care of it. I'm done with it. I'm done drinking it. I'm done. I, I don't want to drink the poison. hope they're going to die. I'm not going to do that. I'm done. Grace and mercy. Doesn't mean you agree with what happened. Doesn't mean that you can condone it. I'm not saying that. I deal with victims that have been severely injured. I get it. I'm just telling you, the things that I need to remember is what's been said in 2 Kings 6, and that is, Chris, give people grace and mercy. And it's not an easy thing. You just don't do it once. It, it is an ongoing process because people are always going to do you wrong. Grace and mercy. And the ones that you commit to and you stand in front of the families and people waste a whole Saturday going to your wedding and the kid that you've been given or the teacher that teaches your kid or the church that did you wrong. Grace and mercy. Finally, if you go down to the end, you'll see in verse 23, so he prepared a great feast. Prepare daily for a godly family. Take all that you just were told and all that, and remember, this is a daily commitment, a daily commitment to be a family of God, a daily commitment not to be afraid, a daily commitment to pray continuously, a daily commitment to show grace and mercy, a daily commitment to encourage people. This isn't a seasonal thing. This is until you are taken up. This is a daily commitment. And, and you're going to have people come into your lives that don't even know your name right now. The lessons we're talking about, prepare daily. In my professional world, we often talk about you perform in chaos, how you train in peace. Things happen in, in, in the police world that 
it's just instinctive. You, you, just, you just don't even understand it because you're you know, preparing in training scenarios and in, in different actions. And when it happens, it just happens. In your own world, it's called the sympathetic response. Something tragic, something immediate happens, and boom, you have a reaction. Well, that reaction, that's exactly who you are inside. I often refer to this as a cup bump. You take a cup of water, and all day, every day, you're pouring things into this cup. And you, you set this cup on the table, and, and it's filled with whatever it is you filled. And next thing you know, your table gets bumped. Whatever spills out is what is exactly in your cup. Well, I'm going to pour into that cup every day the things that when they get bumped, they know what kind of guy Chris is. They know what kind of family. There's a reason why, I, 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 and I encourage everybody to do this, since my boys were 13 years old, I've taken them on a foreign mission trip one week of the year to third world countries and just, just had the worst conditions possible. Haiti, Grenada, Honduras, Chile, Puerto Rico, all, anything hit with anything that's got bugs and dirt, anytime you got to take a shower on day four just to get less dirty, that's where you wanted to be. It's one of, the, one of the best things I could have done as my sons were growing up to teach them humility, to teach them love. And I have prepared that, you know, and, and I do that because I look back and I see the, the benefits of it. When you prepare daily, it's kind of like losing 50 pounds. You won't see the losses at the ounce level. You won't see the losses of all the hard work and everything you do at the half a pound level. But you stack that on top of each other every day and you're going to see the 50. You run a marathon, you don't think about the 26.2, you just get to that one mile mark and you add that on top of each other and you will win. And as we wrap this up, the final verse, it says, so the bands of Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory forever. Because of the man of God that Elisha was and because he told and prayed, Lord, open my servant's eyes so he can see that we're surrounded by more of us than them. You don't need the church to surround your family, the physical church. You are surrounded as a family of God with a legion of protectors wherever you go. And by doing that and preparing daily, you have built yourself a fortress. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 to gird yourself up with the armor of God. You do that daily. You commit daily. You do the things every single day. And at the end, the final command of that chapter is the king of Aram who hated the Israelites never attacked again. What does that interpret to? They lost and they won. You got to fight to win for your family. You got to fight to win for your spouse. You got to fight to win for your brothers and your sisters. You got to fight to win for your kids your teenagers, your young adults. You got to fight to, to win. There, there's, no, there's no valor in losing. There's no honor in giving up. Whatever it is is on your mind, whatever that one person's name or face is, that's who you fight for first. That's who you commit to right now. And if you're already doing it, it goes back to when I really started, and that is validation. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep swinging the bat. Keep coming. I don't even know how long it's going to take. I don't know. But I do know this. Over time, it's going to work. It may not work the way you think, but it's going to work. Them boys are going to be good boys if you do it right. I'm going to tell you this final truth, and I hope that this sets you free. And if I could have my family photo up one more time. <clears throat> the decisions I make now have greater impact. The consequences of my decisions as Chris has a much deeper impact. The family that I have is a gift that I have every day. So when I'm with them or when I'm not with them, follow me now, when I'm talking to somebody and they're not around, when I'm alone someplace and there's no accountability, when I'm making a business decision, when I'm making a political decision, 
when I'm making a police decision, a command decision, when I'm making a Jamie decision or a Riley, Jordan, Taylor, Emma decision, when I say things, when I go places, filter it through this, ladies and gentlemen. Filter everything you're doing. When you, when you picture, and the reason I do that is because I want it in my head that everything I do is to honor them because he honored me by giving them to me. If you don't take anything away from today, let peace be your compass. If whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, you have peace with it, you have this, this internal calmness, let that be your compass. The Bible gives you a peace beyond all understanding. And when you have that peace that you don't understand, even in a storm, it's because you're doing the right thing. When people are freaking out in the camp because they're surrounded, Elisha stood up and said, calm down. It's not, don't be afraid. So I have a very easy life when it comes to how I operate and the chaos at which I serve because I have a peace and I prepare for it every day. And that's my challenge to you. In a minute, we're gonna hear a song. Some may wanna come up here, but I'm gonna ask that even where you're standing, if there's somebody that you need to make a commitment to, you're like, that's it. I, I, I'm, I'm reclaiming the territory. I'm reclaiming it right now. And you feel that that physical action coming forward is going to set a, a message, set a tone to commit, not to anybody sitting in this room, but to you and that person. Then you grab that person by the hand, you drag them up here. You say, we're committing this. Maybe there's something going on in your head and the person's not here then I would ask that as everybody else stands, that you stay seated and you go before the Lord and you commit. You commit to the people that, that don't live the way you live or look the way you've looked or, or do the things that you want them to do, but you love them unconditionally. Like that's what Christ did. He came to love the unloved. Maybe you need to do that. Maybe you need to do some thank you stuff. We talked about always asking. You just got to do some thank yous then you can stay sitting right there. And maybe all you want to do is just praise. Maybe you want to stand up. But I'm going to tell you this. Don't just check out right now. You're engaged in a battle. You just stepped out of the tent. You look around and you see that they're surrounding you. Take action for your family.